you're closer than you think. If you're not successful and you are working hard and you are doing something that's conceptually correct and you are following proper money management and you are being clinically dispatched and, and you are documenting things, and I'll give you a few more little tools here in just one second, you're doing all these great things, then you might be a lot closer than you think. And you might just be one minor tweak away. And that could be something like you're picking stocks that aren't really accelerating in their trends or your net net price movement really isn't that much. You're like, well, Dave, it's a Landry Light pullback. Isn't that a great setup? It's a great setup, but only if you pick the best and leave the rest. One example that I give quite often is if you're getting stopped out a lot. I've had several people over the years, I think one was 19, one was 21, and others were somewhere in between, but double digits. Like, Dave, I just got stopped out 20-something times in a row. I'm like, okay, well, there's two potential problems. One, your stops are too tight. I have fixed, so to speak, a lot of people just by telling them to loosen their stops. And the market doesn't care what your risk is. The market has its own risk parameters, its own volatility. So if you're looking at something that's bouncing around three or four points a day, and you're like, well, I'm just going to risk a point and see what happens. Well, I can all but guarantee you're going to get stopped out on that noise alone. Now, this isn't to say throw caution to the wind. You want to adjust your share size down accordingly. You could take, I think it's it's under members resources, and I think I have it, it not behind the firewall, but I have a spreadsheet there, and you could take that spreadsheet and you could punch the numbers in. You could see as your stop widens, your share size is going to come down drastically. I think, especially if you're getting started, you're you're much better off using an, an almost overly wide stop and trading much, 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 much fewer shares than trying to go in and get it just right. And I think that way you're going to catch more and more winners. And again, like I've said before, and I think I just said a minute ago, I fixed a lot of people, so to speak, by telling them to loosen their stops a little bit and make sure you're outside of the normal noise. That's one little tweak, as you'll see in just a minute or two, Trading is is just making little tweaks. It's not these grand epiphanies, okay? And every now and then you'll get a little epiphany, but for the most part, it's a bunch of little bitty tweaks. And the other thing, again, your stock selection, as I said a second ago, could could possibly need a little bit of improvement. Now, one thing I often say is when you're doing your post-mortem, no matter what happens, it's a good thing, okay? If you look at the stock and say, what the hell was I thinking? Congratulations, you are beginning to get it. It's starting to click with you, okay? And then the the greatest thing that can happen is you do your post postmortem on a losing trade and you look at it and say, well, that trade looked fine. There's not a damn thing wrong with it. If I saw that trade tomorrow, I would take it again. So that's when you sort of have graduated and you're beginning, it's really beginning to click. Now, logic doesn't often apply, and I'm sure if you've been trading for more than a day, you've probably noticed this. A stock has great earnings and tanks. A stock has shitty earnings and takes off. A stock that wouldn't know a fundamental if it bit them in the ass, and that's my favorite stock, okay? Quadruples over a relatively short period of time. Most IPOs have horrible fundamentals. They usually have a little cash going in, but other than that, the fundamentals really aren't that great. They don't, don't really have earnings or whatever. They're the promise of the future. And that's what I named my IPO course, the promise of the future. They trade purely on emotions and that's what makes it such a great market to trade. And that's one of my favorite things. As I sort of joked in the final barn, I've said many, many times before, one day I'm going to invent a trading system that's going to use fundamentals, but the criteria for the fundamentals is the it, it'll use technicals too, right? So the technicals will be it's going to have to be a great setup, like a Landry Light setup, a TKO, bow tie, whatever, and the stock will have to have crappy fundamentals. And I had a couple of my clients said, well, Dave, I think you've already invented that system. <laughs> but I'd, I'd be willing to bet that if you took stocks with horrible fundamentals that had momentum, you would do much better than stocks with good fundamentals and momentum.
and I'd be willing to I'd be willing to encourage you to do that research, and I think you'd be pretty amazed. Now, along the lines of logic not applying, themes make a lot of sense when it comes to the market. Unfortunately, and this is just my empirical research here, maybe you found something different, maybe you're a little better than me, but 99 out of 100 never work. So you would think like, okay, it's logical, let's let's sell short coal companies because everybody's gonna be driving electric cars. Well, I guess it's a bad argument because you need the coal to power electric cars, which you'll see in one second. But as a general statement, you don't want to seek out themes, but you do want to let the themes find you, and that's another advantage of technical analysis, performance-based technical analysis, okay? Buying strong stocks and shorting weak ones, okay? So I remember when this IPO came public, I skipped the first pioneer setup, so to speak. It was a buy a D type of pattern. And I'm like, you know, this is a brick and mortar retailer. I don't know so much about uh, this thing. And this was like in the middle of the pandemic. And it's like, I don't know about this. And then it just took off and went up and up and up and up and up. And then it pulls back nicely and it gives me a setup. And I said, you know what? It's a setup. I'm a technician. I guess I'll take it. And this was recommended a trading service. And it turned out to be one of our bigger winners. So the buy was there, we took initial profits there, and then we rode it out for a pretty long time. And it wasn't the biggest winner ever, but it wasn't bad, 129%, 130% round numbers, and about 9K overall, which gives you, on a hypothetical 100K, gives you a 9% return on your account, better than a poke in the eye. One or two of these makes you a year, right? Well, it turns out people got sick of being inside and they wanted to go out and buy kayaks and do all these other things. Now, here's that coal company. And I'm like, a coal miner? Are you serious in this day and age? And I know I had one client, I don't want to pick on him, but I had one client after it was up about 300%. He goes, yeah, I didn't take that one. I'm like, why not? And he's like, well, I don't like coal companies. And it's like, okay, well, if you want to be a trader, you be a trader, I'd take the money you make off the coal company and, I don't know, buy some environmental credits or or, or do something good for the environment, go plant some tr trees or something, you know? You can't, you can't have a bias where you don't buy certain stocks for certain things if you are to be a trader. And especially me, as a technical analysis purist and as a service provider, if there's something I like, regardless of the industry, I have to show you what I'm seeing and I have to take it, just close my eyes. I might not like what the company does, but hey, if they're going up, I could make a little money in the process, maybe. So if you want to see the, those were taken from the archives, davelearner.com slash archives from a trading service. If you want to see it in real, real time, davelearner.com slash trading service, all one word.